okay, well, if I wait for that vaccination, then number one, I'm at risk for the whole time and gradually the society will open up and I'm, I'm at risk more so because I'm not vaccinated. Hello everyone, I am Nayonika, the UNSW Student Minds Coordinator and the SRC General Secretary. Today we're joined by Professor Raina McIntyre, Head of the Biosecurity Program at the UNSW um, Kirby Institute and one of the expert voices commentating on the unfolding of the COVID-19 situation in Australia. Along with that, we have Dr. Bill Kefalis, Head of Health and Director of the Health Service at UNSW, and Joshua Karras, a PhD candidate at UNSW's Faculty of Medicine, studying vaccine hesitancy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Given that we have a lot of questions, I will um, get started and jump right into it so we can discuss everything about the vaccines and the hesitancy around it. With that, our first question goes to Dr. Rader. The question is, Looking at the global rollout of vaccination, what can Australians learn in terms of the impact of COVID-19? The COVID pandemic really has been the most significant impact on the world since World War II um, in terms of the catastrophic effects on societies, on economies and people, people's health and lives around the world. Um, the development of vaccines has been really phenomenal given that within less than 12 months we had the first vaccines available to be rolled out. Some countries had very rapid vaccine rollouts such as Israel, the United States, the UK. Um, other countries have been slower but there is inequity in access to vaccines around the world. So um, for some countries uh, there aren't available vaccines um, or very few available vaccines. There is an um, initiative called COVAX, which is trying to ensure equitable access to vaccines, but um, countries that will get vaccines through COVAX will not get enough for their whole population. And this is a situation we're likely to see exacerbated over the next few years where um, High-income countries will move on to get third doses and boosters, whereas uh, low-income countries may not have adequate coverage with even their first and second doses of vaccine. There's also a lot of different vaccines available currently which work in different ways, um, and more vaccines are in the pipeline. So there's over 200 other COVID vaccines being developed which will become available in time. Thank you. Um, that's that's very interesting to know to see how that's working. Um, my next question is to Dr. Bill. Um, you know, given the inequity Dr. Reina spoke about, we um, also know there's different types of vaccines that she addressed. And in Australia, we mainly have the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer ones. So what are the main differences between the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines, Dr. Bill? So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines um, have a, a temporary genetic um, code in the in, um, N, um, mRNA, which then inserts itself into the cell, makes the cell produce uh, that protein, and then um, the body's immune system reacts to that protein by making um, the spike protein, by making antibodies, and also the T cells become activated. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine has a viral vector, which is sort of the shell of an, ad, 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 of an, of an adenovirus, sorry, uh, that carries the same sort of genetic code. Uh, and again, it makes the muscle cell make um, the protein, which is the same as a spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus. Uh, and then the body's immune system reacts to that. Um, so far as uh, the effectiveness of the vaccines in real world data, we've seen really, really good uh, and a really great ability of both vaccines to be very effective in present, preventing serious illness and death, both above 90%. And almost at that level uh, with the Delta strain, which is sort of great news for us. Um, the ability of both uh, the vaccines to actually um, like stop us from um, having um, any sort of illness, being it asymptomatic is not quite as good, but still very good. Um, from a general respiratory vaccine perspective. Um, I think AstraZeneca is up around 60% or so. Um, and uh, the 
Pfizer or Moderna vaccines are up around in the 80s, mid, mid to high 80s of pre preventing any sort of infection. So it's really important for people to understand that the, the, that the vaccination is not a vaccine that stops the virus from entering your body. Um, it's a vaccine that makes your body's immune system fight the, vac the virus once it gets into your body. And of course, quite often it fights it off at the very beginning um, and so you don't get infected at all. Um, the um, comparison of the, um, of the effectiveness of the vaccine um, in preventing severe illness and death, though, is probably the most important thing because um, we know that when people get coronavirus, there is very significant um, uh, chances that they will get very sick. And ob obviously some people, as we know, in New South Wales every day, unfortunately, um, some people are dying and some people, some young people are dying uh, from COVID. It's, it's really interesting to know how they work differently, but they both work towards giving you a better immunity. Um, Joshua, my next question is to you as you study vaccine hesitancy. Um, Dr. Bill has addressed the differences in the vaccines, but why have the mixed, uh, why have the messages regarding the AstraZeneca vaccine changed? And why were we first told not to take the AstraZeneca vaccine and are now being encouraged to take it? Sure, it's a great question. Um, and there are many factors and, and different components of this answer, but effectively it's all due to a situational change. Uh, at the beginning of the year, you know, during the COVID zero phase in Australia, the risk benefit analysis uh, favored waiting for more Pfizer vaccines. However, due to the Delta strand um, proving to be you know, twice as infectious um, as the original strand, it's, um, and also that the fact that the strand appears to be affecting uh, younger people in a more severe way, um, it is, you know, once again, that risk benefit analysis demonstrates that it is uh, important for individuals to consider, um, younger people to consider the um, AZ vaccine now. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and it's really good to know that that's something we need to consider. Um, Dr. Reynal, my next question is for you. Um, given the pandemic, um, you know, playing out the way it is, how do you think the vaccines are holding up against the Delta variants globally? So the Delta variant is probably the most difficult and challenging of the variants of concern so far because it has some vaccine resistance, not a lot, but it has some, and it's also much more contagious. So in countries like the US and Israel, which achieved high levels of vaccination with very highly efficacious vaccines quite early, they saw a really good response and, um, you know, they thought they could resume life as normal and, you know, stop the mass mandates, et cetera, in the US. But the Delta variant then took over after April this year and um, they've now started bringing back in mask mandates. So um, they are seeing outbreaks of Delta, particularly in unvaccinated people. So in the US, for example, um, that some of the southern states have very low vaccination rates and that's where the most of the transmissions occurring. However, there have been a number of instances of outbreaks where vaccinated people have also got infected. So against the Delta, you may still, you'll still be protected against infection, but there could be some breakthrough infections, um, but you will certainly be highly protected against dying from COVID or going to hospital with COVID. So the majority of people who are fully vaccinated who've um, caught COVID do not need to go to hospital and don't die from it. So um, the vaccines protect you from the most serious complications of the disease, which is really important. Absolutely. Thank you for raising that. Um, I know, you know, the elephant in the room is that there, the, there's a lot of um, hesitancy and the decision as to whether to get vaccinated now with AstraZeneca versus waiting for Pfizer um, is something a lot of people are contemplating. And I know there's a lot of questions around that. Um, Dr. Bill, my question is to you, um, you know, given the discussions we've had so far, why should students get vaccinated now opposed to waiting for the Pfizer vaccine? Well, uh, let's let's just go back to basics, okay? So, um, as we know from all the vaccination vaccinations we've probably ever had, um, usually there's an initial course, and then there's a booster. And so, what I'm saying to our students um, and anybody who 
cares to listen, is that the current vaccines are for the original Wuhan virus. And so for me, that's the foundation um, of vaccination for, for COVID-19. So let's lay the foundation. Um, let's get vaccinated all as soon as we can. And our immune systems will then be prepared. Okay, it'll be prepared for what's happening now, of course, uh, with the Delta strain. But eventually we'll have booster shots, um, almost certainly, uh, probably hopefully early next year, uh, of mRNA vaccines, which are highly effective and will probably code the Delta strain. And so it's, it's our chance to then say, okay, well, if I wait for that vaccination, then number one, I'm at risk for the whole time and gradually the society will open up and there'll be more mixing again and I'm, I'm at risk more so because I'm not vaccinated. Whereas if I get vaccinated now, um, I'll lay the foundation, I'll have some protection, good protection, but then when the booster comes, um, I'll get even better protection and maybe we'll get to a point, like let's be confident about this, we'll get to a point that the vaccinations will work so well that we will be in sort of be able to live our life relatively freely, yes, with COVID around, but without that risk that we'll get something that might put us in hospital or might kill us or might give us long-term problems. Like, you know, we know that we know young people are catching the virus. Um, the, I think the 19, the 20 to 29 age group is the um, is the highest. Uh, is the group with the most um, cases at the moment. Um, I think there was a study out of Norway that roughly, you know, 50% of um, young people who had COVID um, were getting long-term symptoms, you know, that long COVID problem with a long-term sense of smell, uh, loss of sense of smell or taste, fatigue, um, quite a few other sort of general symptoms. I know from my own experience with um, a couple of um, COVID positive patients that, that we've seen last year, um, both of them had long-term problems, um, you know, uh, from that. Um, so it's, it's not the sort of illness that we should um, just consider as a mild sort of flu-like illness. It's a very serious illness and it's affecting young people. And so that's the reason from my perspective not to wait. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, it's Really interesting to you know understand that there's a lot of information, but everything addresses that the risk is something we need to consider, and that's a huge factor. Um, given that the risk is something we need to be conscious about, Joshua, my next question is to you. Um, you know, we know that there's a lot of risks associated with getting COVID, but what do we do if we have friends or family who are vaccine hesitant, and how do we go about talking to them about you know getting it? Absolutely. I think the first and most important thing to do, which sometimes is difficult to do, is actively listen. Um, it's very easy to dismiss, you know, the, the concerns we've heard before. Sometimes they're not quite based in sound logic or reality, which makes it even more difficult to, to listen to. But just it's very important, I think, to simply ask, what are your concerns for taking the vaccine and just listening until you know, this individual has said all they want to say. Um, I have usually, it, studies show that then repeating back, you know, actively empathetic listening, um, you know, with a tone of compassion and understanding, uh, listening, summarizing back what their concerns are, generally is very effective in kind of uh, uh, creating a bridge or, you know, a dialogue. That's essentially what you're creating, um, which is a very important second step. And building that trust and rapport, whether or not, you know, whether they're your family or not, or friends and um, colleagues, whoever it may be, we've, we've all got one, I think. Um, from that, you create a common ground. Um, usually that common ground is in wanting to preserve, um, you know, the health of themselves or their families, you know, that's usually where you can find some, some commonality there. Um, really want to emphasize that saying, it sounds like you really want to take care of yourself and, and take care of your family. Um, and you can really make sure that you've got some agreement happening there. And then finally, depending on the, on the, the, um, the nature of what their concerns are, um, I've, I, studies suggest that gently introducing the concept of the scientific me method and academic rigor, especially in scenarios where there is a complete absence of it in their reasoning and opinions. Um, of course, admitting that these systems are not perfect, but they are the closest thing 
you know, we as a society have to, you know, valid findings um, and then gently suggesting what the find, what the situation is. The most um, common uh, source of hesitancy is uh, a fear of, you know, what the side effects may be. And that, you know, oh, I've heard my neighbor had a bad you know, negative reaction. This, the vaccine is not going to, um, the vaccine is, is too dangerous, hasn't been tested thoroughly. Well, to that, I would, su I would suggest, you know, mentioning that when you conduct a, a, a risk analysis, this is where emotion, you know, it's important that emotion is in some way taken out. Uh, we want to preserve lives. Um, and uh, if you are very concerned about the safety of, of, of the, uh, of the vaccine, well, then it would be pertinent to consider other practices of your life, such as driving a car, eating unhealthy food, which all have much higher um, a much higher chance of leading to unhealthy outcomes. I think it's just that the, the very strong spotlight that the vaccine has that leads to any particular small issue being completely exacerbated um, and, and taken out of context and uh, not compared to other practices that we do. It, um, you know, to driving, a, being in a, in a vehicle is so much more dangerous than taking, you know, the vaccine as an example. So if you don't have a concern about driving a car, then there's no reason for you to be concerned about taking the vaccine, especially considering that it may save your life anyway uh, in, in, or, you know, stop you from getting very sick. So um, that's my, that's the, uh, the thought processing there. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joshua. Um, and, you know, uh, realizing that we are all in lockdown and indoors right now, um, we are a lot more, um, you know, aware and conscious about how COVID transmissions are also currently taking place. Um, Dr. Reina, my next question is for you. Um, given the context of this second wave, um, indoor venues seem to be the main source of transmission um, in Australia. Can you explain why these environments are so problematic? It's, it's because COVID is predominantly spread through the air that we breathe. It is, uh, you know, touching surfaces is a very minor mode of transmission. Um, really, it's about shared air. So if you think about it like cigarette smoke, if you're in a room where somebody's smoking and there's, the windows aren't open, there's not good ventilation, that smoke build, builds up and builds up. And it's the same with um, aerosols that are breathed out by people. You can't see them or smell them like you can cigarette smoke, but they accumulate in the same way. So that when you're in an indoor setting and there's poor ventilation, you're breathing in other people's exhaled breath, essentially. And that breath contains little tiny um, aerosols that have virus in them. And it's actually been shown through scientific studies that there's more virus in the really, really tiny aerosols than there are in the big droplets that you might sneeze out or cough out. So when someone's in one of those rooms, um, speaking, breathing, just those activities generate aerosols. Um, so if you're in a lecture theatre, for example, and the windows aren't open and the ventilation isn't good, uh, the longer you're in there, the higher your risk of getting infected if one infected person is there. If you're just going in and out quickly, um, the risk is lower. So, And it's been shown that a number of things can reduce that risk. One of those is opening a window. Um, if you can open windows at both ends of the space, even better. Sometimes placing a fan if they've only got one window to open um, speeds up the removal of those aerosols. Um, you can also use air purifiers, which filter out the dirty air if you haven't got good ventilation. Generally, any building that's less than five years old is compliant with vent current ventilation standards, which means you can adjust the proportion of fresh air that's brought in. Um, but older buildings often are not compliant. So you need to look at what's the building you're in, how old is it? Um, can I open a window and think about all those things in terms of mitigating your risk? And of course, masks also help for the same reason. They prevent you from breathing in someone else's exhaled breath. And they also, if you're infected and you don't know you're infected, they prevent you from uh, contaminating the air for other people. And the problem with COVID is that we have up to, you know, 30% of infections are completely asymptomatic, but equally infectious as symptomatic infections. So someone may not even know that they're infected and be out and about breathing out their aerosols um, for you to breathe in. 
So, and that, that also explains these kind of so-called fleeting contacts. Um, I think we've done very well in drilling into people the importance of washing their hands. I don't think we've done as well um, drilling into people the importance of shared air. So think about shared air. There's easy ways of testing how good the ventilation is, including using a carbon dioxide monitor, which you can buy very, very cheaply, little handheld ones like here's my one that I carry around everywhere and I check out the ventilation. Um, and the carbon dioxide is just a proxy for how much of other people's breath you're breathing in, right? If it's really high, you're essentially breathing in the stuff everyone else has breathed out. And that, you know, we don't accept dirty water, do we? If the water comes out of our tap dirty, we don't accept that. We don't want to drink that water. So we shouldn't also accept dirty air. Thank you. Um, what I'm hearing, you know, is a lot of commonality with, you know, compliance and following health orders. Um, Dr. Rayna, where do you see, um, you know, um, and what do you see Sydney looking like in the next six to 12 months? Um, what are the ways out of this current situation? Well, vaccination is, is the long-term way out. It is our exit plan. Um, however, you know, I, I think um, we're at a crossroads where, you know, there's clearly a, um, there's two schools of thought. One school of thought is it's inevitable that we have to live with this virus and everyone's going to get infected. I don't believe that because I believe in the power of vaccines. We've seen diseases like measles, which are much more contagious than um, SARS-CoV-2, um, controlled with herd immunity through vaccines um, in countries like Australia. We've controlled other diseases like polio with vaccines and stopped transmission. And the vaccine pipeline is not static, right? So in six months' time, we're going to have more options. We're going to have amazingly well-matched boosters that match the Delta, that prevent um, transmission of the Delta. Um, so uh, I think, you know, um, I'm hoping that we're, we'll go in that direction of trying to hold on to our gains and wait until we can get everyone protected with vaccines, um, pretty much like New Zealand is aspiring to right now. Um, but there is a chance that, uh, you know, that the... the those who don't believe in that possibility um, may prevail and uh, we may end up with, with a lot of infection, which, which isn't going to, you know, we're not the same as the UK. The difference between the UK and us is that they've had a lot of infection, you know, orders of magnitude higher than we have. We've had minuscule amounts of infection in this country, even now, even in this outbreak in Sydney. So most people, the majority of people are immunologically susceptible to this virus. Um, in the UK, they've got about 50% of their population having had two doses, plus they've had um, you know, a huge proportion of the population infected. So that combined gives you much more immunity in the population than we would, would have. Um, so if we reach 50% vaccination, we're still extremely vulnerable to massive epidemics. Um, and then, you know, what happens when, when you have those big epidemics is that your health system gets stressed. The health system is the weak point in every society. So, you know, the people who want to, you know, live with COVID um, don't realise that every country that has tried to do that has been forced into a much worse lockdown for much longer when the health system collapses, right? We're not at that point yet. But if we get to that point, then um, sadly, the only thing that works then is, you know, the most stringent type of lockdown. Um, and our health system is quite stressed at the moment, um, even though we, we still have ICU beds, et cetera. It's not just about beds, it's about staff as well. And we've had multiple hospital outbreaks. We've had, um, we've had, we do have shortages of staff because a lot of staff are quarantined because they've been exposed. Um, so there's a lot of vulnerabilities in the health system. Um, that remains our, our weak link in society when it comes to pandemics. Absolutely. Um, what would be your best case scenario for the future, given that, you know, there's a lot of risks that we have here, but, you know, on an optimistic note, what would that be? Our, our best case scenario for Australia is that we get to very high levels of vaccination supplemented by, you know, uh, better vaccines or matched boosters next year. Um, and we can protect most people um, with vaccination without having to, you know, 
sacrifice people to infection. Um, and But that includes vaccinating children, right? The Delta is infectious enough that we do have to think about, you know, vaccinating children. We can't, on the one hand, want to live with COVID and then, you know, expose our children to unfettered infection as well. We're seeing ICUs full of children in the US at the moment who are unvaccinated. Um, and many states in the US are reporting their pediatric ICUs are full. So we really do need to think about all those issues. It's, it's a complicated um, pa package. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, you know, there's some really fantastic information that we've gotten out of this session today. Um, I have one final question for everyone. And Dr. Bill, I'll start with you. Um, it is, if you had one advice right now to give to students, what would that be? Thanks, Nanika. Well, people that know me probably would always think that I'm never going to give one piece of advice. Um, <laughs> of course, get vaccinated. So important. And Raina talked about sacrifice. And I think this is our turn to you know think about how can we what sacrifice do we make and it's basically what we're being told like stay at home wear a mask whenever you're around anybody wear a mask when you're indoors and um seek out and get a vaccine as soon as you can thanks perfect thank you so much um joshua what would your advice be to students thanks um as a student myself, I'll say something that I, I expect um, both doctors here will, will, um, will, will say and, ha and have said as well. Um, and that is just keep talking to each other as much as possible. Don't withdraw and go gently and go kindly. Um, I'm right there with you in, the, in how difficult it has been. Um, as, a, as you know, as all well, Naomi, how difficult it is as a student during this time. Um, it can feel very isolating and cut off. Um, there are many opportunities, I think, to get involved. I know that at the end of this term, you know, we've got this big extravaganza, social extravaganza coming up. Just get in, that's one example of many, get involved, um, just keep communicating, work with those lecturers, with your lecturers who are also under a lot of stress. Um, and I think if we do that, we'll emerge, I think, stronger as a result, you know, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. And I think that we, we will emerge more resilient, the most resilient batch of students that, 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 ever, um, that ever there was. Um, and as long as we can treat each other with kindness um, and compassion, I think that we'll, we'll emerge out of this uh, in great celebration. Absolutely, thank you so much for that, Joshua. Um, Dr. Rayner, what would your advice be um, to students? Well, the peak transmission is in young people, people in, your, in the age of most of our students. Um, and university campuses are a huge risk for transmission in other countries. Through last year, we saw, you know, massive amounts of transmission in university campuses. We've done research showing that wearing a mask really reduces that risk. Combinations of sort of blending, blended learning, you know, bit of face-to-face, -face, bit of online, et cetera, reducing the number of people on campus by those means, as well as wearing masks will make a difference and vaccination. So get vaccinated wear a mask, you know, um, at the beginning of this Sydney outbreak, my daughter, who's a UNSW student, um, was complaining that in, in mid-June, after this outbreak had started, she was the only one in her lecture theatre wearing a mask. Nobody else was wearing one. So, you know, we need all of you guys to be wearing your mask, getting vaccinated and doing your bit because you're at greatest risk of transmission and you're in a very high-risk setting, which is on a campus. So, um, do your best and then if everyone's doing their best and doing their little bit we'll all be safer absolutely thank you so much dr reina so you know it's it's safe to say that the final takeaway is you know wear your mask make sure that ventilation is good you get your vaccines um and you stay at home um and do your bit so um thank you so much everyone for joining us today um and really putting um you know some really interesting questions in place and giving us the information we needed thank you Thanks, pleasure. Thank you.